Hey everybody, I am here with Dr. Stephen Mendel and Mr. Sam Mendel at Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles. You can find them at ketamineclinics.com. So we're here to talk about their treatments for mental health and some of the success that they're having with patients on that. So guys, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us, Caleb. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to um, start off just by asking how long you guys have been working with patients on their mental health. Well, I'm a, I was a psychologist before I went to medical school. So I worked for medic, in mental health for four years and uh, it was very vexing. And it was such a challenge to help people with their mental health that I ended up going to medical school and ended up becoming an anesthesiologist. Hmm. So when years later, ketamine was found to be just a remarkable intervention for just the kinds of things I was challenged in helping patients to deal with, or they were challenged in dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a slam dunk for me. So we opened our clinic in 2014. We did a few patients earlier, but we opened in 2014. And uh, Sam is my son and my C COO, and he really helped me to get the clinic going. I handled the medical side and he handles the business side. And it's been a very good combination. Awesome. Yeah, it's great to hear you guys have been able to, to help so many patients. And that's a really cool kind of synergy that, you know, you had both of those fields and they got to work together. Yeah, I have a little less formal training than uh, Dr. Mandel here in mental health, but uh, it's definitely a huge passion of mine. I think my first and, and kind of earliest exposure um, outside of just personal situations was volunteering for Teen Line when I was uh, about 12 years old, which is a teen to teen suicide prevention hotline. Mm -hmm. And I did that over at Cedars in LA. I grew up here in Los Angeles. And um, that was a very cool experience, very empowering to learn a little bit about how to help people through crisis and mm -hmm. support. And I think just as my life went on and I went through my own challenges and we have uh, you know, some challenges with, with mental health and addiction in our family, it's, it's personal work and you know, the opportunity to work with, with my father here and to support uh, you know, a really innovative approach to, to treating these afflictions has been you know, just the best possible thing. It's been amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that being, you know, really rewarding for you guys. And that's awesome. You guys have been able to, to work together and be able to, you know, provide such a great service for those patients. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I was curious to find out from you guys, what do you feel like are, you know, some of the biggest kind of mental health concerns and things that have really seen an increase over the last couple of years, just with, you know, everything that's been going on? Well, the whole background in which we live has become more chaotic, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, pandemics, or great disruption among our leadership, uh, or wars internationally. Uh, people are living in uh, against a context of somewhat chaos. Mm -hmm. And it's really made it more difficult for them to maintain their own equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So th things like um, substance use, Things like uh, partner or spousal abuse, things like child abuse are all way up. Despair is way up. Mm. Hopelessness is way up. Uh, and it's a very unfortunate but a real event that's happening. This is not a, a, an impression from going to cocktail parties. Mm. These are real numbers of people calling crisis lines, people not being able to go to work, people applying for disability. Uh, people having the kinds of illnesses associated with uh, excess substance use. Mm. Yeah, and those things that uh, Dr. Minnell is mentioning all, you know, doubled and tripled over the last couple of years with the pandemic. I mean, even just in the second quarter of 2020, um, from the start of the year, uh, substance abuse, child abuse, spouse abuse, you know, doubled and tripled. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the country. And the suicide, suicide rate has grown exponentially over the last 20 years. And so that's even, you know, pre-pandemic, that's just been getting worse and worse. I think there's so many things that contribute to that. And one of them that I believe is a big factor is just the level of kind of disconnect between interpersonal relationships and, you know, everything being digital and online now with whether it's online socializing, online dating, online, even care, you know, and yes, it's really great and convenient to be able to see a doctor on video, especially in a city like LA, you don't have to deal with the the traffic, the parking, taking all the time to go drive. It's just great enhancement and I'm all for it. And I, I see a lot of my doctors that way, 
but it's not the same as being in person with someone or being in the room, feeling their energy, having, giving someone a handshake or a hug or having that connection, sharing space with someone. And I think that really has an effect on us much more than most of us give, give it credit. Mm. I think it's also trained us to have, uh, to be very, very impatient and have unreasonable expectations sure. in a world where everything is so instant. Mm -hmm. Really just talking about this yesterday. And we have conditioned ourselves and been conditioned to expect with the push of a button, our car pulls up to pick us up. Push of a button, the food comes. Right. A swipe, a swipe on a screen and you have a date that night, right? It's just so instant. Mm -hmm. And the reality is most things worthwhile in life are not instant. And they require mm -hmm. patience and consistent dedication to, for example, your wellness, your mental health. And you go to the gym once and, and be feeling great. You don't get one good night of sleep. You don't have one therapy session. Mm -hmm. and your problems are fixed. But I think a lot of us are, are approaching these things with those expectations and it's, it's causing some, some real issues. Yeah. In addition to that, uh, you started out with the pushing the button and the waiting. Um, most gains in mental health require that you lean in and actually actively participate. Right. You can't push a button even and pause. Mm -hmm. You have to actually get involved. Mm -hmm. And also care, access to care, even with the advancement of, of tele, telehealth, tele, telemedicine is still extremely limited for so many people. Uh, there's such a high barrier to access, largely financial for people, but there are also a lot of areas where there just aren't enough clinicians. And really just throughout the country, there's, there's kind of a shortage of, of good mental health professionals, especially psychiatrists. So people just, even when they are you know, wanting to get help, uh, you know, especially if they're using their insurance, they have to wait you know, many months, I think the average is like three months just to be seen. Um, care is often very mediocre because there's such a high volume, it's rushed, it's you know, come in, get them out, get on to the next. And um, so even aside from the issues that are contributing to these mental health challenges, then we have this issue of, we're not really providing very good treatment or care as a society, when I say we, uh, for these people when they finally come to get help, which so many people have a hard time asking for help in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point too. It's been, you know, really difficult for patients and obviously it's great to see so many, you know, choose to reach out and really get help. But yeah, it is difficult that, you know, they're not really able to, to find that help and get what they need. The reason I think we're doing as well as we are is despite all this gloom and doom that mm -hmm. is really accurate, that's just been described. Mm -hmm. Ketamine is so fast mm -hmm. and so effective and works in such a, a safe, in rapid manner mm -hmm. that um, people are surmounting all of these barriers to come in and get treated because they really get transformed and they talk about it and their spouses and their children and their co-workers and their community members see it mm -hmm. and say what happened to you right and they tell them because they're very pleased despite the stigma and um, so ketamine is 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 making headway mm -hmm. gradually despite all the barriers we started out with. Definitely. Yeah, that's beautiful. I really want to echo that because where there's therapy is great and we recommend that to all of our patients who aren't doing it, the traditional or conventional medications that people are often taking for depression, PTSD, anxiety, et cetera, mm -hmm. often don't work very well and they take months to work. Right. Kind of works in a matter of days, literally maybe a week within one week, people start feeling significantly better. So it's extremely fast. It has none of the side effects of those uh, other medications like SSRIs, SNRIs, antipsychotics, and mm -hmm. any of the oral antidepressants or medications that people take today, they, they have a long list of negative side effects. And ketamine doesn't have any of those. It's a completely different mechanism of action. The way that it works, the actual experience of having the treatment and on a neurochemical level, how it's affecting the brain and, and the body. So yeah. It's a very unique uh, solution, and uh, about 83% of our patients uh, respond. They get a 50% or greater reduction of their symptoms, which we, we call success. So it's very, very high. Um, you know, these other medications are maybe around 40%, uh, so 50%, you know, depending on which literature you want to go by. Uh, and the, and the, the success isn't the same success. People who have ketamine infusions often feel like themselves again, like they haven't right. since they were young. Energized, motivated, they feel good, they feel connected, they are in touch with their emotions. 
when people have success with these med conventional medications, most of the time they report on feeling kind of numb or like a shell of themselves, mm -hmm. where they are able to get out of bed, but they're really not happy. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great point that, you know, they might not necessarily feel as depressed, but they really might not be feeling much of, you know, anything. And the ketamine's allowing them to really, you know, feel a lot more. I think that's a great point. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a, it's really interesting that it's kind of a, you know, like you said, it's a unique way of looking at it. You know, I think we're kind of used to just assuming that the only tr treatments are, you know, medication and doing talk therapy and, you know, obviously both have their place, but it's interesting that, you know, it's a really kind of different approach to it. And it's not, you know, not the same as just doing that, you know, kind of for the rest of your life and just kind of dealing with it. Yes. Absolutely. And I just want to be clear, I don't, I, I don't want to come off like I'm bashing these medications because they do have a place and a lot of people benefit from them as well. Um, so, you know, they, they can help for sure. Uh, a lot of people are taking them and they're not doing well with them. Mm -hmm. the challenges, new challenges as a result of, of taking them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but they, can, they absolutely are, are very helpful to many people as well. Yeah. And um, I was curious to find out from you guys, what do you feel like are some things that patients can do um, especially for those patients that might not be able to, you know, get the help that they need right away. What do you feel like they can do in their own life to really just kind of keep a healthy mental state as much as possible? We have a program that we uh, advocate very strongly in conjunction with our ketamine infusions, and it's a five-point program. I'll give you as much detail as you like, but let me just hit the bullet points. Mm -hmm. It's good sleep hygiene. Mm -hmm. This is crucial. Mm -hmm. It's an exercise program, a real exercise program, not to become an Olympian, mm -hmm. but to be, regain and maintain full use of your body. That's range of motion, that's balance, that's a certain amount of stamina. Mm -hmm. It's nutrition. And we are very persuaded, this is not about that, this program is not about that, but we have both become vegan as a result of hard data. We're not proselytizing. This is not a program about veganism, but there's just no question that the inflammatory process initiated by um, high intake of, of meat and dairy uh, doesn't work well with the biome and with the mental health. Uh, we also strongly advocate for a really uh, close personal relationship with a peer. It uh, doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, but it's got to be close. Someone who you think has your back and who thinks you have their back right. and who you are in communication with ongoingly. Mm -hmm. And the last, the fifth one is talking therapy. We want our patients to be in talking therapy. Mm -hmm. If they have a trauma history, we'd like it to be a trauma-informed therapist. There are some nuances that non-trauma-informed therapists may not be tuned into. Mm -hmm. Many patients have had trauma in their past and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable how many ketamine infusion patients. Mm -hmm. We had a guy set up like his third or fourth infusions. Oh my God, Curly molested me. Right, right toward the end of an infusion. No kidding. Curly was a guy who lived across the street from him 40 odd years ago. Oh. And, he, and I said, you've got to call your therapist right now. And he did. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So I like trauma-informed therapy, but any talking therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not once a month or once a quarter, mm -hmm. but regularly. So those are the five points that really will enhance and extend your experience with ketamine. And you can do you can have ketamine without any of those and do great. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do the best and if you want to have it be sustained. Mm -hmm. Sustained is really important. Then you want to get into those five things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you said, you really need to, to lean into that. And I think that was a great point about, you know, keeping your, your physical health in check too and really how much that can affect your mental health too. Usually. Yeah, I say all the time. I mean, I, I work out, you know, five, six days a week and it's as much or more for my mental health than it is my physical. Um, I notice if I'm working out regularly but less often for me personally mm -hmm. um, i don't have the energy the focus the, the uplift in my mood that i really love about just getting active uh, on, a, on a daily basis and that's weight training the other two days i'm doing some other activity outdoors i'm going for mm -hmm. 
uh, I'm taking a boxing class, a dance class. I'm doing something to be using my body and moving. And you can definitely get a workout doing something fun like that too. It doesn't just have to be, uh, you know, lifting weights. It's, there's so many ways to get exercise activity, but getting some, some sweat going, getting the heart pumping really does a huge, uh, huge amount for you. Yeah, absolutely. That's Even something that sounds lame to a lot of people, we call it walking. <laughs> you've heard of it. <laughs> if you do it for 20 minutes or more, five days or more, you will feel better. You will live longer. All your parts will work better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even outside of all the benefits you can get from exercising, I think just having something that you focus on for that hour or two out of the day and really just, you know, you don't think about, you know, too many of your other problems and hyper-focus on those. You're really just focused on that activity on its own is very, you know, beneficial too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think and, uh, a lot of runners love is it's like meditation, right? Especially right. In particular, you know, and a lot of other things are like that, but it's just you and, and your thoughts, and mm -hmm. you know, tune the world out. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I was curious to find out from you guys, what is the, you know, uh, route of uh, administration that you guys typically prefer for the ketamine therapy? It's a really important point. The promise of ketamine therapy is best achieved with intravenous infusions. Mm -hmm. Ketamine can be given just about any way you can imagine. Mm -hmm. You can rub it on the skin. You can put it under the tongue. You can swallow it. Um, you can put it up your nose. Mm -hmm. uh, and ketamine is used for different things. Ketamine is a drug that's approved by the FDA as an anesthetic. Mm -hmm. It's also approved nasally. Uh, for depression, we give it intravenously. Mm. Our results are based on intravenous. It turns out that about 98% of all the research done on ketamine therapy for mood disorders is done with intravenous infusions. Mm. The other 2% is divided between just a handful of IM studies mm -hmm. and a few intranasal studies and sublingual studies. Mm. So if you want to get what the research says is available to you, mm -hmm. you want to have intravenous infusion. Okay. Now, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, which is a whole different story, is often given orally or sublingually. Mm -hmm. And that is given at the time of the, uh, the treatment, together with the treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it doesn't, it serves a different population mm -hmm. and it works differently. But for getting standalone ketamine therapy, nothing is, comes anywhere close to intravenous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely makes sense. And um, how do you typically determine the you know, dose that you're gonna go with for those patients? We start out with the size and weight of the patient. Mm -hmm. Then we start off with their experience uh, in altered states of consciousness, mm -hmm. whether it's mindfulness or fasting or use of other psychedelics, um, uh, very intense running, mm -hmm. whatever. If they have a, some experience with that kind of altered state, that kind of dissociative state, we'll kind of go toward the higher side. Otherwise we go toward the lower side. We'd like to go low mm -hmm. and slow. Mm -hmm. We're able to do that without wasting the patient's time or hours mm -hmm. because we pioneered changing the dose mm -hmm. during the treatment. And that's something that can only be done with an intravenous infusion. Right. So if we start real low and we, we check, we do a check because of blood levels and kinetics, whatnot, Mm -hmm. I could go too deep into the weeds for you, but basically about seven or eight minutes, we make a check. Mm -hmm. And we have ways of telling both by interview and by examination where the patient is on the disassociative continuum. Mm -hmm. and if they're not close to the sweet spot, we, up, we, rake, we move it up. Mm -hmm. And we may move it up again that session. Mm -hmm. So we can escalate the doses during the treatment. We use an infusion pump, which is computer controlled and extremely precise. Mm -hmm. 
And we infusion means over time. It's different than pushing it in a vein. Right. You're giving it gradually over time. Uh, the old clinics used to have ketamine in, a, in an IV bag and they would drip it. Mm -hmm. Well, you can know at the end of the drip how much ketamine you gave, mm -hmm. but you can't know how much per minute. Mm -hmm. And we, with these pumps, are able to know how many micrograms per kilogram per minute. Mm -hmm. And that's how we dose. And it's very powerful. And, and, you know, on the flip side of that, we can also, of course, decrease the dose when necessary. So uh, if yeah. it is feeling a little bit uncomfortable or, you know, they're getting a little too much medicine or for whatever reason, we can, you know, bring that down. And the effects are felt very, very quickly. And one of the nice things, one of the many nice things about ketamine is it has a very short half-life. Mm -hmm. So um, you make those adjustments, those changes are felt, you know, within a minute or two. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And so for patients, you know, like you said, maybe, you know, experiencing a little bit too much, or what are some, uh, you know, side effects that you guys would typically look out for and, you know, try to help them avoid? Were you talking about side effects from uh, just having the experience? About 5% five, 5 of patients uh, have some nausea. Mm -hmm. And we strongly advocate that they get some prophylaxis for that. And most of them accept it. A few of them don't, and some of those who don't, don't need it. Yeah. And some of those who don't, did need it. And of course, if you give it after they need it, it doesn't work nearly as well. Um, the dissociation sometimes leads to a sense of dizziness. Mm -hmm. I'm spinning, the room is spinning. Uh, that usually uh, abates within a very few minutes of the infusion being completed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people typically feel pretty tired and, you know, kind of fatigued for the rest of the day. Sure. Um, it, some people do feel energized, but I think it's more common for people to be feeling pretty tired. And we recommend they get a nice, healthy meal and rest and just take it easy. They're not able to drive for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Don't recommend they resume work or anything like that. They just, you know, rest. So those are really the most uh, common. There's no long-term uh, negative side effects. Mm. But many of our patients are highly functional and have very... Um mission critical jobs mm -hmm. and they they can come in late in the day and have an infusion mm -hmm. and go home and be perfectly good to go ne the next day mm -hmm. actually maybe better to go yeah i would imagine so but you guys just yeah. be able to, to relax after that at least immediately yeah it was you know after a full night of sleep mm -hmm. you're totally fine yeah so yeah. it's typically you know optimum to get get some sleep before you have to resume things, but yeah, there's no there's no lingering issue with, with resuming work usually. Yeah, yeah, it's good to hear. And um, on average, how many um, sessions are you typically finding the patients need, and do they typically need you know maintenance sessions after those? People typically need uh, in our in our program after a lot of messing with it. Mm -hmm. We've come to the original Zarati protocol from 2006 of six infusions, either three a week for two weeks or two a week for three weeks. Mm -hmm. We don't find much difference between them. We have deviated from that in many ways. Mm -hmm. We've done five in a week. We've done two a week for three weeks. We've done one a week for six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had good success with all of those. Mm -hmm. But when we have the flexibility on our part and on the patient's part, mm -hmm. The, the three a week for two weeks seems to be the best. And the two a week for th three weeks seems to be just about as good. Mm. These are 50 minute sessions. The first one is 50 minutes. The subsequent ones are 55. Mm. With the recovery time and the, and the setup time, patients are in the clinic, aside from their first visit, they're in the clinic just under 90 minutes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> follow-up goes that very widely most people get about three months of relief from the initial series um again you know someone who's going to really embrace those lifestyle optimizations that we discussed right. is going to most likely have much better chances of a longer uh you know benefit than someone who doesn't and we have seen you know people go for a shorter period of time you know maybe several weeks or a month on the low end 
and people on the high end, we have a handful of patients who have gone over two years after one series with no additional interventions and feeling really good. So that's, those are obviously outliers, uh, but possible. And we've seen it more than once or twice. Uh, on average, though, around three months, it's not uncommon for people to get four or five, six months of relief before they need to come back for follow-up care. And, and that looks like a, a, a pair of two booster infusions, we call them boosters, just usually one or two days apart from one another. And that really restores the benefit that they attained in the series and extends it uh, another several months in most cases. What's interesting is over time, uh, most patients actually return less often. So they're able to get more mileage out of each follow-up. Uh, and uh, that's really nice. So someone might come in for a series, three months later, have a pair of boosters, come back four or five months for a pair of boosters, and then put themselves on a on a semi-annual schedule where they're getting two infusions, you know, six months and feeling really good. Yeah, the interval varies with the patient and with their place, their, their evolution through the treatment. And we don't leave that to chance. We are in touch with our patients continually. Mm -hmm. We wanna know how they're doing. We ask them with words, we send them uh, instruments that they can, fill out over the internet. And we send them a daily text message. So we know their mood day to day. And no one day makes any difference at all. But the aggregate of these things graph mm -hmm. tells us and the patient tremendous amount. And we know when they need boosters and they know when they need boosters. The, the subjective feeling of course is the king. How I feel is the gold standard for how I feel. Mm -hmm. But these, these these, these new numbers really help to communicate across people and across disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love to hear that you guys have that, you know, protocol in place for those patients to be able to really just get the most out of it. And it's not that, you know, they're just coming in for the infusion and then, you know, you send them home without anything else to help. We're not a dispensary. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We, we take care we of people. We have the most robust follow-up in the in in our field, hands down. I mean, we have a full-time team of 15 people. Mm. And uh, one of the reasons why we're so heavily staffed is that follow-up and that that rapid response. If someone calls the phone, gets answered. If someone sends an email, it gets responded to usually right. within a couple hours or less uh, at the most. You know, uh, we call all of our patients um, multiple times a year to check in on them and see how they're doing. And we love to hear when they're doing great. And just, we, you know, we get emails back about transformation for them. And we share them among the team and everyone just celebrates, you know, those successes that patients share with us. Uh, but in addition to the kind of subjective follow-up, there's a lot of objective measures with, you know, PHQ-9 assessment, which is, you know, pretty common, uh, you know, depression assessment that we're sending patients through text message, which is encrypted, HIPAA compliant, uh, a software that we're using to do that. And the daily mood question, um, other assessments as well, you know, clinical measures of anxiety, it's one common one is the GAD7, um, depression, PTSD, whatever it might be that the patient is dealing with. And we are tracking those over time. So we are data driven, uh, even though we are really first and foremost wanting to hear from the patient how they're feeling and how they're doing. We're looking at a lot of other measures. Mm. Yeah, it's great to hear. And, um, you know, obviously the main indication like we were talking about is, you know, those, uh, those uh, patients that are depressed, but have you guys noticed it, you know, being effective for any other types of issues and conditions that patients are dealing with? Suicidality. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many, but I'm going to start with that one sure. because that's a critical issue. Ketamine mm -hmm. reverses suicidality better than anything else known at this time. It just does. And it does it quickly mm -hmm. and safely. And everyone who is suicidal should have the benefit to consider this treatment. Mm. If the, uh, the, there are people who are saying, well, let's, let's, let's wait and see further research. Mm -hmm. All of the other interventions for suicide take much longer. Right. They work less well. And some of them leave pretty bad side effects. Mm -hmm. Also, PTSD responds very well. Um, OCD, not as well, but still some OCD patients benefit. Mm -hmm. Some anxiety it can help with. It is more effective in our experience for depression and suicidality than it is for anxiety, but it can help. 
Uh, and then other various forms of depression like PPD, you know, postpartum depression, uh, bipolar depression, unipolar depression. So a variety of different kinds of depression all respond especially well. So mm -hmm. definitely the best um, response rate among uh, those conditions. Interesting. So, a, a wide variety of mental health uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. really we like also have some, some, thank you, Sam. That's, that's good. And you've covered, I think, most of them. But we also get less frequent concerns, like uh, you mentioned OCD. We get disordered eating. And it's amazing how quickly these patients do well, even after having had not benefited from the very best other treatments around. Mm. But for, for, for slam dunk bread and butter ketamine, there's nothing like depression, mm. and particularly like bipolar twos who are depressed and postpartum ladies who are depressed. Mm -hmm. It just works well and smoothly, and uh, the benefits ripple not only through their own lives, but through the lives of all those they touch. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And since Dr. Mandel mentioned substance use, uh, mm -hmm. excuse me, mentioned disordered eating, I'm going to mention substance use disorders. Thank you. Um, because uh, that's that's the one that always raises a lot of eyebrows because a lot of people know of ketamine as you know special K and as a as a, something that people do use recreationally or right. abuse. Uh, or self-medicate with, however you want to try to paint it, but who pe what people use on the street. And what we do in the clinic is a very, very different use, and it affects uh, patients very, very differently. And obviously, if someone's been misusing or abusing ketamine, that's a little bit of a concern is, you know, whether or not this is really the best treatment for them, but for pretty almost any other substance. Uh, and there's a lot, there's studies with cocaine, uh, alcohol, um, we've even had people come and report that, you know, it's been very, very helpful with math. I mean, really, it, the underlying issues there are really often the same, regardless of the drug of choice. Sure. And um, ketamine really helps to curb the cravings, and it really helps to get at the underlying sources of uh, what's driving people to what's most often self-medicate. So the trauma, depression, anxiety, things that are going on that are, are making people feel like they need to escape. Um, Ketamine can help to, to treat those underlying challenges so they don't feel the need to go and, and do that very, very effectively. I'm and so glad you brought that up, Sam. Uh, ketamine was used originally after it was approved as an anesthetic mm -hmm. in a non-anesthetic way for behavior in alcoholism mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And it was amazingly successful. And that kind of got lost in the midst of time because it was done in Russia. In, in Stalinist Russia. Nobody knows about it, but the guy who did it is still alive and he's still working. And um, he had an amazing success rate among real falling down drunk alcoholics in Moscow in the 80s. That was the original use of ketamine outside of the operating room. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's great to hear that, you know, so much of that, that research is starting to come back and we're starting to look into those things that you know, we might not have considered, but obviously, you know, have things like that that really show the, the efficacy of it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, for you guys, um, so I was curious, um, since you did work as an anesthesiologist, did you see, you know, your patients that you were giving it to also kind of report those, you know, uh, feelings of feeling better mentally, or was it really just kind of seeing the literature that got you, you know, into wanting to, to work with it? I never even dreamed of it. Mm. And I was a ketamine artist. I gave a lot of ketamine to a lot of people mm. because as, as the, the way surgery was done, transitioned from inpatient to outpatient mm. and intubation and general anesthesia fell by the wayside. I used a lot of ketamine and propofol intravenously, mm. became quite good at it, did a lot of it, mm. had a big mobile anesthesia service, never noticed any impact on mood, hmm. never. And when I was first told of it, I thought it was BS. I hmm. couldn't believe it. Hmm. It took me so many months actually to overcome my bias that this is an anesthetic. Hmm. And I had gone to graduate school in clinical psychology. I was very eager to find a solution, right. but I couldn't believe an anesthetic was gonna help people with their behavior problems. 
and I learned. Yeah, yeah, it's great to hear. It's one of those things I'm sure was uh, pretty shocking, you know, but once you see the, the oh, really? results and the studies it has to show. It took probably a decade. And the way it happened is guys were coming home from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and having surgeries here for tertiary treatment of their war wounds. Mm -hmm. And most of these guys were pretty beat up. Mm -hmm. And they had it as a, as a code diagnosis, um, PTSD. Mm -hmm. And the people doing this work were most interested in getting their wounds fixed up. They didn't care. But the younger junior people rounding on them would come at like, oh my, he slept through the night. Mm -hmm. He told a joke. He doesn't, mm -hmm. he said he didn't have any, um, any nightmares. Mm -hmm. And it took almost a decade to put that together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But, um, you know, I can understand that it was probably a pretty big shock and something that, you know, it was a little difficult to put together, but very thankful that it finally was. So counterintuitive. Yeah. So fortuitous. Yeah. Definitely. And, um, you know, obviously, like we were talking about, you know, patients uh, these days are a lot more likely to be able to, you know, want to seek out help and not, you know, wait until things are so debilitating. What do you feel like are some signs that, you know, patients can look out for when they're trying to decide if they should, you know, seek professional help? The people who used to pick up the phone are letting it go to voicemail. The people who used to not answer their texts are not answering their texts. Uh, the people who are used to uh, talk to their wives are snarling. The people who used to snarl are grunting. Well, I think Caleb's also asking not just observation of when your people you care for are in need, but how an individual who's dealing with this knows it's time for them to reach out and ask for help. Um, when you wake up and you uh, have any regrets about waking up, mm. it's time to reach out. Sure. That's definitely, I, I would say, uh, further along on the spectrum. I think some of the things that might manifest sooner are when you just stop experiencing pleasure from things that yes. give you pleasure. And, you know, clinically it's called anhedonia and it's, it's a scale. And uh, when just things feel like a chore, uh, you normally would have enjoyed going and seeing a friend, going to the movies, going to a boxing class, you know, whatever, to the beach, stuff that you typically really enjoy doing starts just like work, not good. And if that, you know, everybody has difficult days and times and, and, you know, situational stuff for sure that happens for all of us. But when that starts to persist for two weeks, or it's going on three weeks, then you need to take a look at things. Or at least, in, at least inquire. Yeah. Know, what's really going on? Yeah. Mm. That's good. Mm. And you know, most even though it can be some people, you know, care can be cost prohibitive. Sometimes there's a wait list. You know, it might be difficult, especially if you're trying to use your insurance. But most uh, doctors, at least around here, or or you know, therapists or people in mental health, will at least uh, chat with you briefly for a quick consult. Sure. So if you're really not sure. You know, try to get someone on the phone, even just, hey, if I have five, 10 minutes of your time, I just, I, I just want to see if, you know, I even need help. And mm -hmm. they can help you get to the bottom of it usually pretty quickly. And then it's just a matter of, okay, how are we going to make it work? Are you going to work with that person, someone else? How are you going to pay for it? Can you use insurance or not? And then you can get into all that. But definitely important to assess kind of what, what's going on for sure. And, you know, talking to friends and family and, and, and getting their support is hugely helpful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I think there's a lot more um, support groups and group therapy out there than patients realize, you know, it doesn't always have to be, you know, the one on one if they're not able to access that. Absolutely. And a lot of people are not enthusiastic about therapy might have had a bad experience um, in the past. And, you know, finding a therapist is, or even a good group, you know, it's kind of like dating. I mean, you really got to find the right match and it's you're not not always going to find the right one the first try and you have to really persevere through that and it is really worthwhile when you find someone who you connect with who's competent who you feel like really cares about you that's worth a lot mm -hmm. worth a lot yeah yeah i think that's great advice and um what would be the best way for patients to get in contact with you guys there we're going to tell anybody to take a look at our website for starters it's uh, ketamineclinics.com 
That's K-E-T-A-M-I-N-E. So ketamineclinics.com. A uh, ton of great info on there. Um, they can also call us 310-270-0625. Um, we answer the phones Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's a sick time. And uh, there's no charge. People want to call and just ask questions. Uh, we also provide free medical consultations. So if someone speaks with us, it seems like they're a good fit and they're serious about moving forward, we'll go ahead and schedule a call with someone on the clinical team to actually review their treatment history a little more in depth and uh, continue to assess if it's a good fit. Again, no charge at all. So there's, there's really no, no obligation. Uh, and then uh, if people do want to move forward from there, we, we take good care of them. Awesome. Yeah, that's really great to hear. Well, yeah, those were, um, you know, pretty much questions I had for you guys, but is there any, you know, last advice you wanted to leave the patients with if they're struggling with their mental health and just not really sure what they should do? I think Sam said it very well, but I'd like to leave people who are suffering with the notion that they're not uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, I'm sorry, but they're not alone mm. in their discomfort and that there are solutions. One of the first things that happens when people get depressed is they feel helpless mm -hmm. and they feel hopeless and they feel worthless. Mm -hmm. In addition to the anhedonia that Sam mentioned, uh, the helplessness, hopelessness and worthlessness are symptoms. They're not the truth about you. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think, um, you know, hopelessness is definitely something they start to feel and it feels like they're the only person that you know, is dealing with that. There's no possible solution for it when, you know, obviously it's not the case, even though that really can feel like such an overwhelming feeling. It's a huge barrier to seeking help. Definitely. Well, yeah, I love the, uh, the work you guys are doing there. It's really clear that, you know, you guys care a ton about the patients and you want to see them get, you know, as much help as they possibly can. So I really appreciate you guys, you know, doing what you're doing there. Thanks so much. Thank you. I just would like to add that with that hopelessness, you know, a lot of people who come to us have tried a lot of things before they get to us. Mm -hmm. And this treatment really does work very differently uh, from any, anything else out there. So please don't assume that you're, you know, broken and can't be fixed or you're just a non-responder. There's no hope for you. Sure. As, as Dr. Mano was saying, that hopelessness is really a symptom. And it's understandable if you have a long history of not benefiting from stuff, you might feel that way. This is different, consider it, uh, reach out if you have any questions, we're happy to talk with you. Awesome, yeah, that's great advice. All right, perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk today and share the uh, the education. It was really great talking with both of you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Of course, all right, thanks guys.